Welcome to the ninth Chicago African Summit, my friends. My name is Ali Kaver. I'm the Executive Director of United African Organization. My friends, distinguished participants, sisters, and brothers here today, thank you so much for joining us. We want to thank the Chicago Access Network Television, CAN TV, for covering our event today. CAN TV is such an invaluable uh, space, you know, for all of us in Chicago. It plays the kind of role that helps multiple and diverse voices be heard in this city. So CAN TV, thank you so much for covering our event like you did last year. We hope to reach our Chicago family at large through CAN TV as a result of uh, their coverage today. We start this year's summit, my friends, with a piece of good news from the African continent. Nigeria, the most populous black nation, just had a peaceful and democratic transition of power. Yesterday, we witnessed the historic swearing-in ceremony of President Muhammadu Buhari. In his inaugural speech, he told fellow Nigerians not to succumb to hopelessness and defeatism. We can fix our problems, he declared. President Buhari has given us hope that with principled defense of democracy, adherence to the rule of law, the African continent will produce leaders with integrity and the moral fortitude to confront the cancer of corruption and stop the social economic decline in many African countries. We wish him success and pray that Nigeria once again becomes a role model of good governance in Africa for all of us to emulate. We hope that he will use his good office to vigorously advocate for peaceful and fair elections that respect the sacrosanct mandate of the ballot all across Africa. On behalf of the United African Organization, we wish Nigeria and all Nigerians at home and abroad well, and we hope that things will be right for Nigeria. <laughs> My friends, we also witnessed a major public health disaster in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone in last year. The Ebola outbreak in those three countries underscores the urgent need to strengthen public health infrastructure and end the systemic misappropriation of funds that are meant for providing critical care for the people. We now have an opportunity to design and implement innovative ways to deliver health care, especially in the most remote rural corners of uh, various countries in Africa. Let us also remember the hundreds of refugees who drowned in the Mediterranean trying to cross to Europe from North Africa. Their death calls for a more humane policy that upholds the dignity of refugees, asylees, and immigrants in general. Let me take this opportunity to thank our members, leaders, interns, staff, and volunteers for the work we do every day to advance social justice and opportunity in our community here. It is this call to action and service that keeps us going forging strategic and principled alliances with those who are in the trenches of various struggles, and reminding each other that we live in a permanent state of interconnected aspirations. Our fight is their fight, their fight is our fight. We are all together, whether we are fighting for the right of uh, black people to live in dignity here without police brutality, or standing up for undocumented immigrants all across this great state of Illinois. It's one struggle, one people, moving towards a new humanity. My friends, we are also at a time when the, the state of Illinois is undergoing the serious budget crisis. What does that really mean for us? We as Africans are the fastest growing immigrant community in the state of Illinois. And by the way, we are the most educated immigrant community in this state and in the United States of America. So everything that affects immigrants really affects us too. The growth of uh, Illinois is not only sustained by the mega corporations that we hear about these days a lot, it is also propelled by various community organizations like the United African Organization. These community-based organizations offer key services to immigrants and refugees through support from the immigrant services line item. Governor Rohner's recent budget proposal would eliminate the immigrant services line item, which includes the New Americans Initiative and the Immigrant Family Resource Program, IFRP. Uh, without programs like NAI and IFRP, many immigrants will not have access to vital safety net services in Illinois. The application process for citizenship is intensively complex and many applicants need assistance. 
The NAI grant enables UAO and various organizations to assist the African immigrant and all other immigrants with various citizenship and immigration services, including fee, uh, free monthly citizenship workshops. Helping immigrants, my friends, to achieve citizenship directly affects the state economy, as those who attain citizenship, according to data, increase their earnings by an average of $7,000. Uh, members of the Illinois Coalition for Immigrants and Refugee Rights have been instrumental in providing more than 530,000 immigrant and information for uh, citizenship and, of course, assisted more than 95,000 people to fill out forms over the last decade or so. The NAI would also be seen as a very cost-effective program uh, for the state to invest in. Immigrant families need a lot of help with attaining access to social services and integrating with local communities. IFRP grant has over the past 20 years connected over 500,000 immigrants and refugees to social services in the state of Illinois. UAO is able to help many African immigrants gain access to these services like food stamps, Medicaid, and other vital social services through the IFRP. In the 2014 fiscal year alone, the IFRP program assisted over 71,000 individuals at about $59 per case, which makes it greatly cost effective, Mr. Governor. Cutting ISLI immigrant services line item funding will increase the state unemployment rate as state or staff will have to be laid off and many immigrants will go without valuable services offered by our members. Uh, furthermore, 85% of the organizations benefiting from IFRP and NAI would not be able to support their staff and 79% of the same organizations will have to discontinue IFRP or NAI services. Not only will the state economy be negatively affected, the communities that we serve will also suffer as a result of these expected budget cuts. And you will be hearing a lot about the state's uh, budget crisis later on in, during the course of this summit. But there's one thing that we all can do. We can contact our state senators and representatives today to maintain funding for the immigrant services line item. This is very essential. And I think that uh, those who are in the business of cutting budget should remember that uh, they are human beings on the other side of uh, the debate. As we focus on the passage of immigration reform, and which is taking forever at the, at the uh, national level, my friends, let us also pay attention to the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program. Too often. Uh, we'll realize that uh, immigrant activists tend not to talk a lot about the refugee resettlement program, but it's a vital program because people escaping from bloody civil wars, whether in Burma or Somalia or Democratic Republic of the Congo or other part of the world, uh, like Iraq, uh, definitely need security and dignity. The refugee resettlement program provides that kind of support. The rate at which uh, the uh, refugees achieve uh, greater security depends on where they are resettled. And the United States of America is such a valuable destination for many vulnerable refugees around the world. Let us continue to support a dignified refugee resettlement program and call on the Obama administration to increase the number of refugees who are resettled in the United States of America, especially from countries that have been historically underrepresented in the refugee resettlement program, even though they may have large numbers of refugees eligible to be resettled in the United States of America. I'd also like to thank our many supporters and allies today who have been standing with us over the years and supporting our work to empower our community. Special thanks to the Illinois Department of Human Services, the Woods Fund of Chicago, Weber Foundation, the Field Foundation of Illinois, the Pope Brothers Foundation, Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation of Illinois, Prudential Financial, and Alpha Wood Foundation. We thank you so much for your support over the years to give United African Organization the capacity to serve as the voice of the growing African immigrant and refugee community in the state of Illinois. We also like to say a special thanks to our panelists this year. Without you, our summit will not be what it is. And we hope that uh, many of you joining us today as panelists will find the summit uh, as one of those essential events where passing information on to our community and to the wider Chicago community will make a difference in the lives of ordinary people here. You are all highly respected experts in your fields with rich perspectives, and I believe that the summit participants will benefit greatly from your presentations today. Finally, I would like to thank all the participating agencies in our resource sphere. 
And please make, take time during the course of this summit to participate in the resource fair and have access to information and resources that I hope you, your friends, your family, your communities will benefit from. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the United African Organization and leaders who are present with us today, like our board members here, Rosemary Tamba and others, I wish you a productive and rewarding time at the ninth Chicago African Summit and Resource Fair. Thank you, and let's go out there and cause more trouble and invent a new world. Thank you so much. And we'll start our ball rolling with Sandra coming up to introduce our first panelist. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Kaba and Eunice are a tough act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, so we're just setting up the, the PowerPoint presentation. And in putting together this panel, um, I really tried to uh, think of issues that uh, affected the African community but were less known. Um, so uh, the, the title of the panel is Protection for Immigrant Victims of Domestic Violence, Crimes, and Human Trafficking. And these are issues uh, that, that come up in the African community, which is why uh, we have two great panelists, um, Amy Martin and Olivia Villegas, and I'm going to ask you to come to the stage now. Um, Amy is a staff attorney with the Legal Assistance Foundation uh, in the Trafficking Survivors Assistance Project. Um, she received her uh, JD from UCLA Law School and holds a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, Ms. Uh, Martin has uh, experience in the areas of public benefits, housing, and immigration uh, law. The goal of uh, the project uh, at the uh, Legal Assistance Foundation is to provide a comprehensive client-centered legal services to survivors of human trafficking. So it's not only purely legal services, it's a comprehensive type of services. Uh, these services are not limited to, to immigrant uh, immigration, are, are not limited to immigration um, relief. Olivia Villegas is the staff attorney at Lifespan, the immigration project there. Uh, she works with immigrant survivors of domestic, domestic and sexual violence in helping them, uh, immigrant survivors, um, petition for immigration protection and benefits under U visa. VAWA, which she will be talking about, and removal of condition uh, petitions. Prior to working at uh, LifeSpan, um, Olivia was in private practice representing individuals in removal proceedings. She has a graduate degree. Uh, she is a graduate of the University of Michigan and the DePaul University uh, College of Law. So again, please join me in welcoming both of our panelists. Thank you, Sandra. Good morning. So again, my name is Amy Martin. I am a staff attorney with the Legal Assistance Foundation um, here in Chicago. And I'm going to give a brief presentation today on the issue of human trafficking and talk briefly about um, some remedies available to victims of human trafficking. So my presentation is going to cover you know, what is human trafficking. Um, go over some remedies available, and I'm going to focus specifically on the T visa, um, and Olivia is going to talk more about the U visa, and then briefly just where to find help here in Chicago. So what is human trafficking? So I'm going to start with a, a brief hypo um, of a case that came through my office recently. Um, a 33-year-old man named Joseph turned down a busy street in Manila in the Philippines to attend a job interview. He'd moved there earlier to complete a degree in business, but when the economy tumbled in 2008 and the job market dried up, it became difficult for Joseph to make ends meet. His cousin had told him about a recruiting firm looking to staff up a hotel chain in the United States. Things could change for him, he just needed the right opportunity. 
When Joseph arrived at JFK Airport in New York City, his employer immediately took his passport and other legal documents at the baggage claim. He was driven to, Philadelphia, to the Philadelphia area and forced to live in the decrepit basement of a hotel where he worked cleaning rooms and performing other types of maintenance jobs. He shared the basement with 10 other workers and worked about 18 hours a day. After two weeks, he received his first paycheck of $50. The other workers in the hotel were told, he and the other workers in the hotel were told that, they, that if they left the employer, they could be arrested by the police. When Joseph or the other workers complained about their meager wages, the employer threatened to call immigration officials and sometimes resor resorted to physical violence. He remained trapped in this situation for a year. Fearful of contacting the police and with no connection to anyone in Illinois, um, Joseph decided to, con with no connection to anyone in the Philadelphia area, Joseph decided to contact an uncle in Illinois whom he'd never met but who he knew lived in the Chicago area. His uncle wired him some money for a bus ticket to Chicago, and that night, Joseph slipped out of the hotel's back door in hopes of finding help. His uncle helped Joseph contact a social service agency here in the Chicago area, and once the agency identified him as a victim of human trafficking, this agency connected Joseph to the Legal Assistance Foundation, and we were able to help him apply for a, a T visa, a trafficking visa. Um, so I'm going to do a quick quiz for you all. Um, so this one's kind of a giveaway, given, given the hypo I just shared with you. But true or false, sex trafficking is the only form of human trafficking. False. Correct. So the federal definition of trafficking includes both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. True or false, human trafficking is a crime that always involves crossing state or international borders. So those of you who said false are correct. So the legal definition of trafficking does not require transportation across borders. Although crossing borders is often part of the crime, it's not required to be considered human trafficking. True or false, trafficked persons can only be foreign nationals or immigrants from other countries. Absolutely right. So the federal definition includes, can apply to foreign nationals um, and also US citizens. True or false, foreign national trafficking victims are not always undocumented. So this one's actually true. Um, although some foreign national victims may be undocumented, many of the cases we see actually um, in involving foreign national victims, the victims have legitimate visas, such as the H-2A visa or the H-2B visa. In order to qualify as a trafficking situation, there must be elements of physical restraint or force. Correct, so that's false. So the, the legal definition of trafficking does not require physical restraint or force. And psychological means of control, such as threats or abuse of the legal process, can sometimes be sufficient to constitute trafficking. Human trafficking only occurs in illegal underground industries. What do you guys think? Absolutely right. So it's false. So trafficking, um, human trafficking can be identified whenever the means of force, fraud, or coercion are present. It doesn't matter if it, it and it often occurs in, in many legitimate industries. So what is human trafficking? So under the federal definition, whether we're talking about sex or labor trafficking, three elements are required. The process, which involves recruiting, inducing, harboring. The means, which involves force, fraud, or coercion. And the purpose, which is involuntary servitude, debt bondage, slavery, or sexual exploitation. This is true unless we're talking about a crime, a sex trafficking crime that involves a minor, in which case you can eliminate that second element, and you only need to show that the crime involved somebody under the age of 18 for the purpose of commercial, of commercial sex act. So as I mentioned, vulnerabilities exist for 
legally documented workers and also undocumented workers who typically fill labor needs in many, many different industries, including hospitality, landscaping, construction, food service. We see cases spanning every industry. And who is a victim of domestic trafficking? So the media often paints powerful images of what trafficking victims look like, and you often see very stereotypical images involving usually women in the sex trade, um, but really trafficking is, is a very diverse crime. It involves minors of any gender, adults of any gender, native women and girls, US and foreign born individuals, refugees, immigrants, LGBTQ youth. Um, it can involve anybody. And this, this, there was a recent study done uh, by an organization called the Urban Institute that involved a pretty small sample size, but it gives a sense of you know, how it really does span so many different industries. Um, as you can see, in the study they did, um, they found, of labor trafficking victims, they found 37% of cases were involving domestic servitude type situations, 19% agriculture, 14% in the restaurant industry, and then you see all these other industries represented as well. Recruitment can be through many different means, um, through fake or legitimate employment agencies, labor brokers, the U.S. guest worker program, again, the H-2B or H-2A programs, through acquaintances, friends, family members, internet, newspaper, many different means. And it's important for us to establish good screening tools for identifying trafficking victims. Some of the things we often see um, when a case comes into our office is that the person might not have their passport or any identity documents. They may not know the area very well. They may be very isolated. Um, they often you know, have some kind of debt they're dealing with. Um, you know, um, they felt compelled to stay in a situation. Um, so, you know, we, run, we have a very comprehensive screening tool we use when working with victims. And there are many barriers that might prevent someone from seeking help. Um, as in the case of Joseph and the hypo I mentioned earlier, you know, he was very afraid of calling the police because his employer had used that as a threat. So, you know, fear of deportation, um, fear of losing custody or access to children, language access, extreme isolation, cultural ideas of family shame and honor, close-knit communities, the role of religion, you know, lack of understanding of US laws. So I want to move on to talking about remedies, immigration remedies. And so Congress passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act Trafficking, Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act of 2000, excuse me, um, which has been renewed three times since the year 2000. And this, this is um, the act that gives law enforcement the tools to combat trafficking and also gives individuals a private right of action to seek relief in the form of civil damages and restitution against their trafficker. The act also created an office within the Department of State that coordinates with foreign governments in providing victim services and prosecuting traffickers. Trafficking cases can be prosecuted under many different federal laws, as shown here. And also to date, actually all 50 states have passed some type of criminal anti-trafficking law. Some are better than others. Um, and in many cases, um, particularly under federal law, restitution might be available to the trafficking victim. Civil remedies are also often available, such as trying to obtain back wages for a victim if it's a case of labor trafficking or possibly pain and suffering. Um, our agency often tries to, we, we work with pro bono attorneys um, to assist our clients in filing these civil suits and to recover damages. And as far as immigration remedies, there's three main remedies available to victims of human trafficking. Continued presence, the T visa, and the U visa. Immigration status is, if we're, if we're working with a foreign national victim, um, immigration status, you know, it can be a very powerful remedy. Um, it can, you know, 
sever dependence on potential abusers and traffickers, protect the person from potential detention and deportation, give them the ability to work legally, provide economic and financial assistance, and a path to lawful permanent residency. Continued presence is a tool that only law enforcement can give to a trafficking victim. So we, we cannot advocate for victims, we cannot apply for continued presence, but we can advocate with law enforcement to provide them with this remedy. Um, it keeps trafficking victims in the United States um, for 12 months, up to, you can re be renewed for a period of three years to assist with the investigation of the trafficking crime and it provides legal status and work authorization and also access to public benefits. And then of course the T visa. So a lot of our work involves assisting trafficking victims in applying for the T visa. In order to qualify, you have to show that the person is a victim of a severe form of trafficking, that the person has been physically, that the person is physically present in the United States on account of the trafficking, that they've complied with any reasonable request for assistance by law enforcement, and that they would suffer extreme hardship involving unusual and severe harm upon removal from the US. So these are the four elements we need to show. So to show the first element um, that the person is a victim of a severe form of trafficking, again, we've got to show that there's the process or action that the person was recruited or obtained in some way, again, not necessary to cross borders, that there was the means that the person, this is usually the most complicated element to prove. Um, so that we have to show that there's force, fraud, or coercion involved in the crime. Coercion includes threats of serious harm and a, a scheme, that there is a scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause a person to believe that failure to do something would result in serious harm or abuse or threatened abuse of the legal system. Again, physical harm is not always necessary if there is severe psychological abuse. Key questions we ask is whether the person felt free to come and go from the situation or whether they felt compelled to remain. And then of course we have to show that this was done for the purpose of involuntary servitude, debt bondage, slavery, or sexual exploitation. Again, this is true unless we're working with somebody under the age of 18 who's a victim of sexual exploitation. And I won't go over in detail everything that coercion involves, but here are some of the factors we look at in assessing a case. There's often a fine line between labor, ex and when we think about labor trafficking, there's often a fine line between labor exploitation um, and labor exploitation that rises to the level of human trafficking. Um, factors that often push cases into the realm of human trafficking could include threats to contact immigration or use the law against the person in other ways, threats of violence, severe intimidation and control, and again, taking away identity documents, such as the passport, is, is a big one. The second element we need to show is that the person is physically present in the US on account of the trafficking. Either that they were brought to the US by the trafficker, or they entered on their own accord, but were trafficked after they entered the United States. And if the person escaped, a lot of times a person may have escaped the trafficker before law enforcement became involved in the case. In that situation, we have to show that the, the victim had no clear chance to depart the United States in between escaping the trafficker and reporting the crime. Um, the third element is that the victim must comply with any rec reasonable request for assistance um, by, by state, federal, or local law enforcement in the investigation or prosecution of the case. So the person must demonstrate a good faith effort to report the crime and must be willing to cooperate with law enforcement. This is often very scary for people, especially folks who, might, who may be undocumented. Um, and so we, this is something that our office um, we often assist people with this process, and it, it can really, um, 
it's interpreted pretty broadly. Um, and sometimes, you know, law enforcement may want to um, interview the person and, and pursue the case and prosecute, and sometimes it may just involve a phone call to law enforcement. So this, this element um, isn't as scary as it sounds. And finally, the, we have to show that the person would suffer hardship, um, extreme hardship involving unusual or severe harm if removed from the United States. This is determined by an aggregate of factors. The factors do not necessarily have to be related to trafficking. Um, and examples might include lack of access, they would lose access to social, to social services in the US that are helping the person recover from trauma. They may have an, a health issue unrelated to the trafficking. Um, and they may, if you've removed from the U.S., they may not be able to pursue justice against their trafficker, either criminal justice or in the form of um, a civil remedy. So applications usually take a few months to put together. This is sort of the bread and butter of the T visa application, the I-914. And the first step in the process is usually to help the person report the crime to law enforcement and help them through that process if they haven't done so already. The government allows for 5,000 T visa applications each year, and this cap is rarely met. In 2014, 944 people applied for the visa, and the government approved 613. T visa benefits include four years of legal status, work authorization, public ben access to public benefits, the ability to take out student loans, qualify for FAFSA, and after three years, or whenever the criminal investigation is complete, if there is an investigation, the person can apply to, for lawful permanent residency. In certain cases, people might also be able to apply on behalf of eligible family members. And I won't go into all the details, but this gives a, a layout of, um, of who may be also be eligible to apply in addition to the principal applicant. The timeline for benefits can, can, the timeline for these cases can vary quite a bit. Generally, from the time a case comes to our office, the whole process can take anywhere from six months to a year and a half. But from the time we submit an application to the government, the government takes usually about four to six months to process the case. There are certain differences between the T visa and the U visa, which Olivia is gonna talk more about. The T visa, again, the cap is 5,000 a year. In the case of the U visa, it's 10,000 a year. And, we, and um, we did reach the cap for the U visa for the last six years, I believe. The processing times are very different. The T visa processing time is four to six months. The U visa processing time is much longer and, and can take a few years. Um, there are some differences in which derivatives, um, such as family members, are able to apply. And with a T visa, you are eligible for benefits and student loans. With a U visa, you are not. And so, where to find help? So, our program, the Trafficking Survivors Assistance Program, is part of the Immigrants and Workers' Rights Practice Group at the Legal Assistance Foundation. We are funded by a two-year grant from the Justice Department and we provide comprehensive legal services to both citizen and non-citizen trafficking survivors. So not, we don't just focus on the T visa, but if folks have other issues, such as family law issues, um, housing, public benefits, consumer, any of those issues, um, we, we can also take on those cases. We cannot assist victims with criminal matters because of the nature of our funding, but we can assist with most types of civil um, legal issues. And if, um, just briefly about the Legal Assistance Foundation, um, we're 100 plus full-time attorneys and staff split between five different practice groups. So we have attorneys that specialize in employment issues, um, immigration, housing, public benefits, and we can utilize this expertise. Okay, and so just my last slide, um, and I can also um, pass along this information to you all. Um, 
after the presentation. This is our 1-800 number. Um, we have a hotline and email address if you'd like to refer any cases to us or ask us any questions about our program. And to report trafficking cases, there's also a national 24-hour hotline that you can call and um, you can provide anonymous tips to this hotline. Um, so thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I think we're going to do questions at the end, right? So if you think of anything, just maybe jot it down, and then um, we can go ahead and answer at the end. I'm going to talk a little bit about just the immigration process in general to give you some background into where VAWA and the U visa kind of fit within that realm. Um, so one of the first things that I wanted to mention was just how people obtain immigration status. There's different ways. Um, the main one or the largest, I would say, program is the family-based, where you have a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident who can petition for certain family members. Um, there's employment-based. Uh, if a company wants to sponsor somebody on a temporary visa, there's also a possibility for a permanent visa or other um, work-related um, programs. That's a possibility. There's a diversity visa lottery. I was talking about diversity visa lottery. It's basically like winning the lottery where you apply. Certain countries qualify, um, and you apply, and every year there's a, a visa, and you can win a green card pretty much. Um, there's other special categories for people who want to invest. So if you have, um, I believe, it might be like half a million dollars for a nonprofit um, that you want to start or a million dollars for a business, then you know, we can give you a green card. There's refugees and asylees, those programs, and then relief from removal. So certain people who have no status in the U.S. Um, but are caught up with immigration at some point may have some form of relief um, before being de or from being deported. So just briefly to talk about the family-based petitioning um, process, it's a two-step process. You have to have um, a family member who can petition for you, basically a, a legal permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. You have to establish the family relationship to begin with. And then the second step is to go ahead and apply for a green card, either here in the United States or abroad. And that just depends on sometimes complicated rules about how you entered the country. Um, uh, and then that determines um, which process you would go through. There's what's called immediate relative versus preference category. So uh, certain relatives of US citizens are given more priority in a sense they don't have to wait as long to get to the green card process versus preferences. So um, for example, lawful permanent residents, their family members have to wait a little bit longer. And that's because there's a certain number of visas that are available to individuals and to particular countries. And I'll show you um, which are the countries that have the most immigrants and kind of where those preference categories fit in. As I mentioned, only certain family members qualify. So if I'm a US citizen, I can petition for my parents, I can petition for my spouse, for my children, and for my siblings. But I can't petition for an uncle or a grandmother or a cousin. So it really gives you those very you know, immediate family members that you can petition for. The process can be expensive. It can be lengthy. Um, and oftentimes, the petitioner, um, the, the US citizen or the legal permanent resident, maintains control over the process, at least initially. Um, and I wanted to mention that because it's going to be important in the context of VAWA under the Violence Against uh, Women Pro, um, Act. So just to give you an, an idea in terms of um, the preference categories that I was mentioning, so you'll see China, India, Mexico, and the Philippines are up there because those are the countries that have the most immigrants in the United States. Um, the wait times for those individuals are pretty, I mean, pretty bad. <laughs> uh, for example, in Mexico, if you're looking at a certain category um, like F4 down at the bottom, that's for siblings of U.S. citizens who are of Mexican ancestry. Um, they're just barely looking at petitions right now from 1997. So that means that they could be waiting almost 20 years. Like if I petition for someone now, they could be waiting 20 years before they can get to that second step of getting a green card. So the other categories, um, every, all other countries fall under the, the first column. And in that one, I mean, it's still pretty bad because they're looking at petitions from 2002. So that's kind of the backup that's been created um, because of these restrictions in terms of how many visas can be available. And so there's a lot of people here who may have the means to become a green card holder, but they have to wait so long um, to be able to do that. 
So special problems that are posed um, by domestic violence for battered immigrants, as I mentioned before, usually the abuser or the petitioner maintains complete control, at least in the initial process of filing that petition for them. Um, the abuser may threaten or use immigration status as a form of control. Language or cultural barriers are always um, usually present, isolation, limited family support, especially if the uh, individual is here without any other family in the United States. There's fear of retaliation if the crime is reported. Um, and then there could also be fear or distrust of government or police. Um, a lot of my clients may come from countries that um, typically don't respond well to domestic violence. They, you know, it's considered sometimes um, just a family matter, and so they're, they're not used to being able to report something to the police and having uh, an effective response. And so all those factors play into oftentimes keeping someone in that cycle of violence. So I'm going to talk about uh, the VAWA self-petition to begin with, and then we'll talk about the U visa. So the VAWA, basically it's the Violence Against Women Act. It was passed uh, back in 1995 by now Vice President Biden. Uh, and it's been reauthorized numerous times. The last time was in 2013. And each time um, we try and get like a little bit better, uh, improve it. Um, and basically what that does overall is that it allows someone to go through the immigration process on their own if they can prove certain things. Um, so to be able to qualify, you have to be the spouse of a, an abusive U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident. And this applies to women and men. It's not just specific for women. I know the name it says women, but um, I've had male clients as well who qualify and who applied for that. Um, Non-abused spouses whose children were abused would also qualify. Children, abused children of U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents also qualify, and we've had those types of cases. There's a restriction in terms of age. Typically, the child has until the age of 21 to apply for a benefit, but if they can show that the abuse was part of the reason why they couldn't do it, um, then they have until the age of 25 to do so. There's also the abuse the intended spouse. So I've had clients where um, they were ma they're married to a U.S. citizen, but it turns out that they're not actually legally married because he lied to her and was actually already married to someone else. But if you can prove, um, if my client can prove that she, there was some sort of marriage ceremony where she believed that there was a marriage and she was marrying him in good faith, then um, we could get over that uh, restriction. And then there's also abused parents of U.S. citizen children. Um, so they, they also qualify to petition if the, if the child or the son or daughter was abusive to them. So the things that the self-petitioner must prove, so this is the, the battered immigrant, is that the abuser um, is a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident. And so a lot of times um, we need to have some concrete evidence of that, um, whether it's a birth certificate, a passport, a copy of the green card. But we know that a lot of times, because the abuser keeps control of documents, of any sort of paperwork, sometimes it's hard to do that. So we try and think of creative ways to figure that out. Maybe a US citizen is registered to vote. So we'll look for in the registry to see if there's um, any proof of that. The children's birth certificates will usually have the place of birth of the father or the mother, whoever the abuser is. And so that can also be circumstantial evidence of their status. For green card holders, we can actually ask immigration to check their records. So we provide the name of the abuser, date of birth, any other information that we might have in terms of how they became a green card holder, and they're willing to look that up in their system to confirm that for us. Um, uh, the second requirement is that the, you have to prove the legal marriage, so it has to be a marriage certificate. As I mentioned, there's an exception if, if there was some sort of um, bigamy involved on the part of the abuser, as long as you can prove um, that there was a ceremony and that you believed that you were marrying him, and um, then that, that would be sufficient. Then there's battery or extreme cruelty. So it doesn't mean that um, the person has to suffer physical abuse all the time. There are other forms of abuse that, when taken together, would be considered extreme cruelty and would qualify as well. So I've had clients um, whose abuser never hit them, but controlled them, isolated them, you know, verbal abuse, it became psychological, and so there's definitely ways to, um, to craft that argument to, to have them qualify. 
there's a residency requirement saying that the, abuse, the, the victim or the applicant has to have lived with the abuser um, at some point. Um, and so sometimes that becomes difficult because we need to be able to prove that you can say that I lived with him, right? But um, we need to try and get either some sort of like bill that she received or any sort of document or even letters from someone knowing that um, that they can, um, that they saw them going into that house um, would be sufficient. And then the final requirement is good moral character. So the person has to show that in the past three years at least, they've been a, a good person. And sometimes we have clients who, let's say, have been arrested for like retail theft or something similar like that. If we can prove that that was related to the abuse, then that can be waived. Um, Basically, a lot of times if she went in to steal diapers for the child because he wasn't providing money or he forced her to go and steal CDs or jeans or whatever it was, um, we can, if, we, if it was related to the abuse, then we can definitely um, try to get past that. So just to talk a little bit about battery or extreme cruelty, in the actual regulations it's defined as any act or threatened act of violence, including any forceful detention which results or threatens to result in physical or mental injury. But it's also qualified by other abusive actions may also be acts of violence under certain circumstances, including things that may not appear violent initially, but when taken together, they are violent. And so that's what I was talking about in terms of um, isolation and control and other forms of verbal abuse all of those things can be crafted to um, explain how that situation was abusive. Um, Amy had mentioned derivatives as far as um, individuals who are essentially dependent on those petitions. So children in the United States may be included in the VAWA um, petition. They don't have to prove the same thing. So any derivatives, just they, we have to prove the relationship between the petitioner or the applicant. Um, but they don't have to go through the same process of proving all the elements that the applicant is um, applying. And the child's age is locked at the date of the receipt of the petition. So children um, qualify if they're under 21 and unmarried. Um, so as long as we can file a petition before their 21st birthday, then their age is locked in and they can still qualify to also get the benefit. Children outside of the United States also qualify, and it's through a process called following to join. So I have clients, for example, who come here um, on a fiance visa, get married to the abuser. The abuser promised that he was going to bring the children over at some point and then never does. And so um, we file the petition, include the children, and eventually the children are able to immigrate with their green cards or their, their immigrant visas as well and join their, their mother or father. Um, the important thing to remember when it comes to VAWA is that you can still be married to the abuser and file the petition. That there's no requirement that you get divorced. There's even no requirement that you live separate from him. And I've had clients who um, perhaps are too afraid to leave the relationship at that point or don't have the means to take care of themselves economically without, let's say, a work permit. So we are able to work with them um, creatively to be able to file these cases even if they're still living with the abuser. So we might have an email address where I communicate with her or certain times of the day in which I can call her um, when the abuser's not in the home. And then once we're able to get her that green card um, or even just the work permit to begin with, that gives her some sort of independence to then be able to move out on her own. And that's essentially the, the purpose of VAWA to help these women or, or men um, get out of these abusive relationships. Um, the restrictions do come in when um, there has been a divorce. You have to file within those two years of the final judgment. Um, if the abuser is deported um, in connection to domestic violence, then you have two years from, that, from the point that he was deported. Um, and then if the abuser dies, he has to be a U.S. citizen. The green card holder um, doesn't qualify for this exception, but even if the U.S. citizen abuser dies, the person has two years from that point to file the petition. Then just really quickly, confidentiality. So the immigration is prohibited from telling the abuser or even calling him to confirm anything about um, filing this vow self petition. They can get in trouble. They, you can sue them um, for any sort of disclosure of information. And then similarly, it prohibits immigration from taking any information from abusers 
um, let's say that the abuser somehow finds out that they're filing for this process and they call and say, she, just, she married me um, just for the green card and this is all fraudulent. And I've seen letters that they've actually sent um, to clients' files. And so they, immigration keeps them, but they understand um, that a lot of times this is part of the abuse and they can't use that information unless they do their own investigation about any sort of fraud arguments. The benefits of VAWA, um, initially when the, the first petition, the VAWA petition is granted, you get deferred action and access to employment authorization. As I mentioned, you can include children inside or outside of the U.S. and eventually leads to a green card process as well, getting a green card. All right, so I have five minutes, so I'm going to try and fly through the U visa. Um, okay, so I think Amy talked a little bit about the creation of the U visa through the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act. Um, the requirements include being a victim of certain crimes, and I'll, I'll show you the list of those qualifying crimes. You have to show that uh, as a result of that crime, you've suffered substantial physical or mental abuse, and that you have um, cooperated in the past, are currently cooperating, or will likely be cooperating with law enforcement in the investigation or prosecution of the case. This one is, the, so the U visa is different than VAWA in the sense that um, there has to be no, there doesn't have to be a relationship with the perpetrator of the crime. So clients of mine who may be together with a U.S. citizen but are not married, if we can go for a U visa, then that's going to be the process because we can't go with VAWA if there was no legal marriage, right? So um, in this case, this kind of opens it up a little bit more for other victims of crimes who don't qualify for the VAWA petition, um, at least in the, in the work that I do. The perpetrator of the crime doesn't have to have any sort of immigration status, which is also um, another requirement for VAWA, right? They have to be a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident. Um, so for the U visa, you don't have to prove that. Uh, and you have to have a law enforcement certification. And that's basically a three-page document in which either the police department or um, the state's attorney's office or some sort of law enforcement agency basically certifies or confirms that you were a victim of a crime and that you did cooperate with them uh, to some extent. These are the, the list of qualifying crimes. Um, domestic violence and sexual assault are the, the crimes that I usually work um, with, at least my clients come in for those sort of crimes, but there's a, a different array of, um, a larger array of crimes that also qualify. The U visa can also include derivatives, which are dependents on the application, similar to VAWA. Um, don't have to prove the same requirements. It's not as expansive as VAWA derivatives, but you can include certain family members. Um, we have what's called indirect victims as well. So a lot of times I have clients who are undocumented whose children, let's say, were victims of sexual assault, but the children are U.S. citizens, so they don't need the U visa, right? But under law, um, they would be the parents would be considered indirect victims, and so we could, quali we could apply for them um, they would have to prove the, the requirements, prove that they were helpful. Uh, as we said, they are considered indirect victims, and then they still have to prove that they've suffered some sort of harm um, as a result of what happened to their child. So keep that in mind. That's also a possibility. So U visa benefits. Um, once the U visa is granted, you get the visa for four years um, and includes employment authorization that's good for four years as well. As I mentioned, you can include qualifying family members either in the United States or abroad as well. Um, and then may be eligible to apply for a green card after three years of maintaining that um, U status. Amy mentioned that there's um, a cap. So there are only 10,000 U visas that are issued per year and usually go in October is when the new 10,000 visas are available. And there's been a lot of people applying for this um, benefit, and so there's a huge backup right now. And what's happening is that you can still file for a U visa. Most likely in about a year, you'll get a response. That's how long it takes right now just to, for immigration to eventually get to your, ap to your application. And if they think that, that you have a good case and they want to approve it, but the only reason is that they don't have any visas left because they've run out for the year, then they'll give you deferred action, which is protection from deportation and access to a work permit. And you can continue to renew that every year until you get the official U visa. So right now it's just it's taking a little bit of time in terms of actually getting to the U visa and then the green card. It's a long process, um, but people can definitely still apply. And I think there are a lot. There's a lot of advocacy in terms of trying to expand that number of visas per year so that people can just kind of move on with their lives. 
And then um, just some legal resources um, in the area that I refer to as well. Um, lifespan, we only have one attorney, me. And so uh, we, um, it's, I can't take every single case, but I work with other agencies in the area as well, and we refer cases to each other um, for similar cases. Um, so yeah. Thank you to both of our panelists. Um, you should have been given uh, paper and pencil to bring up some questions. Do we have any questions in the audience? We just have time for one or two. Uh, can someone, uh, yeah. So uh, I guess this, the first question is a question for Amy. Uh, for TVs as how do you demonstrate force, fraud, or coercion to law enforcement? Uh, is testimonial evidence acceptable? Secondary evidence and I'm trying to read the second question. So that's a great question. So what we us we like to submit um, as much evidence as we can in the application, usually to show force, fraud, or coercion. Um, the primary piece of evidence would be the, the victim's declaration. So we would put together an affidavit from the victim explaining what happened to them. Um, and that is usually what we use to, to show that element. And the second question is also for you, Amy. So, you, so this says you usually don't hear about labor trafficking in the US. Uh, it's usually from other countries. How pervasive is it in the US, of labor trafficking? Um, also a great question. So I would say it's, it's very pervasive in the U.S. and it's, it's very hidden in a lot of ways. Um, we work really closely with um, the, at our agency we also have the Illinois Migrant Legal Assistance Program which does a lot of outreach to migrant farm workers here in Illinois. And a lot of the cases that come through that program are trafficking that occurs um, among an undocumented population in southern Illinois that's um, working in you know the fields, migrant labor, and also through the H-2A program, um, which also provides a source of labor for the migrant workforce. Um, and so a lot of our cases at our agency, just because we have this program that we work very closely with, um, in, involve um, migrant rural labor cases. Um, but I would say it's it's a lot more, before I started, since I've been doing this work over the last several months, I've really, it's really opened my eyes to how pervasive it is, you know, really in every industry. Um, and so I would say, um, it's, you're right, it's not something we hear a lot about in the media, and it's not, you know, the images we see of trafficking doesn't often involve labor trafficking, but it is something um, that, is, that is unfortunately very, very common in our society. Thank you, Amy. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for in terms of questions, but uh, I, I can take the questions back to the office and respond to you. So thank you very much. Thank you, our immigration panel.